You guys know what this is, right? Nobody knows what this is? Yeah. It's a prop. Very good. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's water. Uh, but it's a Dixie cup. Not very big. Holds a couple of ounces of water. And as strange as it may sound or seem, it reminds me of Christmas. Now, before you start thinking that maybe there was something other than water in this cup, uh, I want you to, to, to understand we're getting into the Christmas season looking at the wonder of Christmas. And we're going to be looking at it through the eyes of some of the people that actually experienced it 2,000 years ago. But what I think a lot of times we forget, we look at the miracles of Christ. He walked on water. Um, he fed 5,000 with a couple of loaves and, and fish. He uh, healed people and raised people from the dead and raised himself from the dead. And we think, those are some those are some home run miracles. Just as big of a miracle, maybe even the biggest miracle of all, depending on how you look at it, is when God stepped out of heaven in all his majesty, in all of his eternity, his, his infinitude, and put himself in a limited vessel. So when I look at this cup, I think, what would it take to fill this cup with the oceans of the, of the world? couldn't be done. It would take a miracle to do that, and a, and a huge one. Imagine the oceans, all the water on the planet fitting in this little tiny Dixie cup. We would be in awe of that. That would be amazing and miraculous and incredible, and that's exactly what took place. God stepped out of heaven and became a human being, filled a human vessel with everything that he is, and, and that's kind of, kind of what we're looking at this Christmas season, the wonder of Christmas. So let me ask you, uh, ask, ask you this. What does Christmas do to you? Now, there's all kinds of answers. Stresses me out, okay? How many of you get stressed out when you go shopping at Christmas time? Yeah, it's crazy. There's people everywhere. It's, it's, it's really insane. Maybe stressed out because of, or anxious because of finances. Maybe... Um, Stressed out or, 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 or crazy busy about preparing meals and, 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 and decorating the house and, and everything it entails. And, but I want us to step back for a second and try to recapture what it's supposed to do to us. What is Christmas supposed to do to us? And this is not an, uh, an, an anti-Christmas tree, an anti-buying gifts or an anti-eating Christmas dinners or an anti-any of that stuff. But let's, let's take a look at what it actually is supposed to do to us. And that's what I want to, want to do. Uh, what, you want to look at questions like, what feelings does it invoke? Core feelings. Not the superficial stuff that's happening around us because traffic is crazy or stores are busy or they ran out of things or whatever. The Christmas tree lights don't light or, you know, whatever. But, but core emotions. What actions does it produce? What does Christmas because it's a different, different time of year. There's no two ways about that. Things are different. And we are different. So, so why? What does it do? What wonders does Christmas ignite within us? And we're going to, like I said, we're going to look at through some of the eyes of some of the, the, the people who were there. And, and it's only right to start with Mary, I think. I think that's appropriate. Uh, and we're going to take a look at her. Mary was, of, Mary was actually of the royal line of David. She, her family can trace their roots all the way back to King David, which is important. And we're going to take a look at that in a little bit here. Uh, but Luke 1.26 says this. In the sixth month, that's the sixth month of her, her uh, um, cousin Elizabeth's pregnancy. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God into the city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph to the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so very much for this day. We thank you for uh, uh, allowing us to come before you, to worship you and, and, and adore you in spirit and in truth. Lord, I ask that you would guide us today. Father, I ask that you would help us to, to see Christmas in a different light or a deeper light. Lord, help us to see you 
and the miracle of Christmas. Father, we love you so very much. We come to you in Jesus' name. Amen. So, a little background on Mary. When, when the angel Gabriel appears to Mary, she's, we figure, scholars think, actually, that she may have been around 14, 15, maybe 16 years old. Okay, that was kind of common back then for girls that, of that age to be espoused or to be engaged to somebody. They wouldn't necessarily get married right at that time, but they would be engaged and preparing for marriage during that time. Okay, and we, they call it, the Bible calls it betrothed. And betrothal was a binding contract. It was as though they were married, only they weren't living in the same house, sleeping in the same bed, raising kill, children, anything like that. They were, they were but it, it, was, it was as legally binding. Okay, you got, it's important to understand that. And we know also that she was a virtuous girl, meaning that she maintained her purity both physically and spiritually. She was living close to the Lord and, 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 and is living a good life in the Lord. So she's a, what we'd call a good girl. Uh, she's what we would call a girl that was uh, right and proper and, and leading a good life. She probably had her life all planned out. Teenage girls do that, don't they? Uh, teenage girls, more than teenage guys. Guys are like, I just want to go and play a sport, okay? Or I just want to eat something again, like I did two minutes ago, okay? But girls tend to, a lot earlier in life, tend to plan their future, and, and it's, it's, there's nothing wrong with that. That's how God wired you. She probably had planned out her future, and things were going well. It was probably a, a very bright future awaiting this, this young girl, and, and, and she was probably excited. She's already betrothed. She's already engaged. She's already ready to be married at some point in the future, whether it was going to be two or three years or whenever it was going to be. And she was ready for it and excited about it. Ladies, think about when you were engaged. And the excitement that you had about being married, about becoming one flesh, about planning the wedding and, and, and planning life. And you were, ladies, were you a little excited about marrying your, your, your hubba bubba? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. And guys, we were too, just a little different, you know. Uh, Mary must have been very, very excited about that. And she had a lot to live for. And, you know, we really like it when life goes according to plan, don't we? We really like it when we, we map things out for our future and they actually go that way. And when they don't, it kind of throws a big monkey wrench into things. No doubt Mary enjoyed it as well. No doubt Mary was just ready, just ready for it. And then things changed. And we read, uh, beginning in verse 28, uh, the angel came unto her and said, Hail thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation or greeting this should be. So when Gabriel makes his announcement to Mary, her, her life is immediately turned upside down. First of all, it's not every day that an angel pops up in your house. It wasn't a common thing. You, we think, oh, the Bible, things happened all the time like that. No. Remember, the Bible covers about, about uh, a, a, a four or 5,000 year period. And, you know, so it wasn't like every day somebody, you know, an angel was popping up in somebody's house. Every day there was a miracle going on that people were able to see and, and directly associate to the, to the hand of God. This was not a common practice. Okay? And... She was about to, her life turned upside down immediately. She was about to receive the greatest honor of all time. She's about to be the vessel by which God is going to enter the world. That Dixie cup situation. She is the one who's going to bring in the Messiah whom God's people were uh, looking forward to and, 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 and hungering for for thousands of years. But, at the same time, it carried some tremendous social disgrace as being, a uh, uh, being with child outside of marriage during, in that culture was, was, was not good. And she was a spouse. She was pure. She was a virgin. But she was going to be with child. It was going to change everything 
for Mary for the rest of her life. And that's important to understand. Back then, if you were a child outside of marriage, there was, there was even the possibility of you being put to death for it. Okay? It was a very, very different world. But God will often allow things to happen in life that are, are kind of hard to bear or hard to understand. Imagine being this, this 14, 15-year-old girl and being told by this angel, hey, you know what? You're going to be pregnant. You're going to bring the Messiah into the world. Talk about turning your world upside down. And, and that's kind of, you know, we read the story, Mary, we kind of read it like, oh, yeah, Mary, that must have been great. You know, you were, you were going to bring God into the world. That must have been, yes, but along with it came a lot of baggage. Along with it came a lot of tro- trouble and trials and, and difficulty. And, and God, God allows that to come into our lives so that we can grow closer to him and know him better. It's easy to question God when things aren't going according to our plan. But it's far more noble to trust him through it. And, and, and we kind of see some of that going. You know, God never says life is going to be easy. But he does say that it's going to be worth it in the end. And, and we see that in, in Romans 8, uh, 18. It says, I reckon, this is Paul writing, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. So life happens. Sometimes we have little or no control over the situations that we find ourselves in. Sometimes. Sometimes they're our own direct cause. But sometimes we find we have no, no control over that. However, we do have control over what? I don't have any control over what happens in my life, but what do I have control over? How, how I react, how I respond to it. We don't have any control over what's going to, sometimes what's going to take place. But I absolutely have control over how I'm going to respond to that stuff. Okay? And if I believe that God is on the throne, I need to also understand that the stuff that's coming into my life that I don't have control over, that I didn't cause, are part of God's plan for my life. So I, need to res- I, I, I can respond accordingly. And, and we're going to look at right now how, how Mary responded to the will and plan of God. Because that's what this is. This is the will and plan of God in the life of a, of a teenage girl that probably, probably nobody else during that time would have been able to handle. Otherwise, he would have picked them. You think about that. You think, why did he pick Mary? Because God, God wired Mary in a way that she was going to be able to bear it. There were a lot of 14, 15-year-old girls during that time. But Mary was chosen. And, and Mary was equipped. And Mary responded... And we're going to take a look at that. So you can follow along in your notes. How did, how did Mary respond? What, was the, what did it produce in me? What did Christmas produce in Mary? The very first Christmas. What did it produce in her? What did it do to her? What did it invoke within her? Well, we know a couple of things. One, Mary was faithful to the Lord. Mary was faithful. We know that. We read, in Luke chapter 1, 26 and 27, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent uh, from God unto the city of Galilee named, to a virgin espoused. Okay? She was a virgin. That word refers to a female that is physically pure. In fact, it's, it's mentioned a couple of times in, this, in, in verse 27 here. Uh, God chose a vessel to bring his son into the world, and that vessel was going to be a pure vessel. And we say, well, why is that so important? Couldn't, couldn't God use anyone? Can't God do anything? Well, you've got to be careful with that. God is omnipotent, uh, so he's all-powerful. He's on the throne of the universe, but God never goes outside of his order of things, the way he determined things, okay? So we say, well, why is it so important? Well, because God promised that the Savior of humanity would come from the seed of a woman, all the way back from Genesis 3.15. So, you know, I know people say, oh, you know, I, I've heard people say, well, the Bible's very uh, male-oriented. Uh, God doesn't have a whole lot of um, value in women. I hear that. And, and I want to say to them, from the very beginning, he gave women the most honored place in all of time. One woman at some point in the future, was going to be the vessel through which he was going to enter humanity, not through a man, but through a woman. And that, to me, 
is incredible. But not just any woman. This woman was going to be a pure and holy vessel. (laughs) So God sent the Savior into the world through the body of a woman without the aid of a human male. Why is that so important? Uh, Romans 5.12 says this. Wherefore is by one man, who's that? We're talking about Adam. Sin entered into the world, and death by sin. So death passed upon all men for that all of sin. Just as Adam passed along his human nature, he also passed along his sin nature to his sons, to his children. So we a lot of times have some of the quirks and characteristics of our parents, right? Some, some, of, the, some of the, you know, you look at your sons and your daughters and you say, hmm, yeah, that's kind of like, Reminds me of me when I was your age. Now, you, ever, you ever look at that? Usually, if it's something, my wife will remind me, if it's something that's, that's bad, if my child does something that is not good, or if it's a characteristic that is off, she'll say, yeah, he's a lot like you. Okay? And when something really good, I'll say, he's a lot, no, I don't do that. Sometimes I do, if I want to score points. I say, oh, honey, she's beautiful, just like you points and she looks at me she knows she just kind of gives me she gives me that sideways glance like I know what you're up to but but in reality we do keep some of the characteristics we do have them okay you guys look like your mom you know uh, boys you look like you got similar characteristics to your dads it's and and the same thing with Adam only Adam passed on something that was going to be affecting you and I even today not the way we look, not a, a uh, character quality, but sin nature. It's passed through the seed of the man, which is why it was so important for God to come just through a woman and without a man involved at all. Because he needed to, he, he, was, he was fulfilling a prophecy. And God had to come into the world without sin. He had to come into the world without that sin nature. He had to come into the world pure, holy, and righteous. He would inherit a human body, but he would not inherit human sin, or human sin nature. Galatians 4.4 tells us, When the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a what? A woman made under the law. Okay, very, very important. Mary was a young woman who had been prepared for this moment. And history tells us that, that every faithful Jewish girl at that time was hoping and praying for the, to be the one to bring the Messiah into the world. Mary was faithful. And therefore, she was eligible to be a part of God's glorious plan. And there's a lot of um, practical application there. Mary was prepared and and remained prepared for God to use in his eternal plan. If we will take that and we will be faithful and we will say, Lord, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to prepare? How do you want me to be pure and holy? We set the stage to be used of God. We don't control God, of course, but we set the stage to be fertile ground, so to speak, to be used by God. So Mary was faithful. Mary was also obedient to the Lord. She was obedient to the Lord. Luke 1.38 says this. This is, and I gotta, I, whenever I read this, I got to remember, she's a 14-year-old kid, and she's saying this after this information. Mary said, Behold the handmaiden of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. Mary, guess what? You're going to bring the Messiah into the world. Yeah, it's going to come with a lot of problems, a lot of heartache, a lot of pain. And we find out later on uh, uh, from Simeon and, 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 and that it, it's, it's going to be really bad for her when Christ goes to the cross. Okay, we, we can't forget that either. We'll talk about that uh, um, later on in the year, or next year rather. We're going to talk about how she saw that. But, you know, hey, guess what, Mary? You're going to bring... The, uh, somebody, you're going to bring the Messiah into the world. You're going to be socially ostracized. You're going to be shamed in front of people. You're going to be, you're going to be mocked and ridiculed. And to top things off, you're going to outlive your son. Because he's going to die the most horrible and gruesome of deaths. And what does she say? Okay, Lord. Whatever you want. I'm yours. Whatever you want. <laughs> Wow. 
By doing this, she set an example of obedience and surrender to, for us, for believers, for years and years to come. Her, her, she didn't even qualify, she didn't even add anything, she didn't even say, okay, I'll do this if, she said, you're God, I'm your handmaiden, I'm your servant, whatever you want. 14 years old. Amazing. Amazing. And there are times when I complain about some of the most trivial of things that God calls me to do. And I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. 14-year-old girl showed me up 2,000 years ago. I need to wake up. I need to be obedient like Mary. <laughs> when the angel appeared to her, she was, she was amazed and frightened, but she, but she she was prepared to follow the will of the Lord. She was ready and willing to do anything that he asked. Imagine the faith required for that. I thank God for people like Mary who are willing to, willing to obey the Lord regardless of the potential consequences. Uh, in, in, fact, in fact, our obedience is an offering, is an act of worship, is an opportunity to demonstrate our love for God. Our obedience in what God calls us to, to do is God giving us the ability to worship him. To, to, to praise him, to offer him our love. You think, what can we possibly give God? You know, it's like that question, what do you give to the, give the person that has everything? You've heard that question before. You know, we're buying Christmas presents this time of year, and there's that person, you think, that person's got everything. What am I going to give them? Well, God literally has everything. Everything in all existence belongs to him. And you think, what in the world? It's his birthday, not mine, first of all. What do I give God this Christmas? Well, According to the scriptures, John 14, 21 says this. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them. This is Christ speaking. He it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my father. And I will love him and will manifest myself to him. In other words, you want to love me? You want to declare your love for me? You want to show your love for me? You want to prove your love to me? You want to worship and adore me? Obey me. Now, can we worship God through uh, uh, other means, can we worship God um, through singing? Can we do that? We did it this morning. But if you go back to the Old Testament, what did God say to the people that were singing but not obeying? He was saying, it, it's, it sounds bad to my ears. I don't even like it. Well, can we, back in, in the Old Testament times, they would offer physical offerings to the Lord in, in worship. But what did God say about that? He said, when you do that but your heart is far from me, I, I spew it out of my mouth. It, it, it disgusts me. He says, I want your heart. And the heart is either going to obey or disobey. When we obey, we set the stage for, to be able to worship God in spirit and in truth. And that's the beauty of Mary here. She, she says, I'm going to do it just because you said so. I'm going to obey you. And she gave an offering to the Lord of worship in that moment that has never been uh, uh, um, overcome, that has never been uh, uh, shown up, that has never been, uh, nothing greater than that. And when we obey God, it's the same thing. So she was, she was obedient. Where others saw trouble and burdens, Mary saw an opportunity to serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Probably any other girl during that time would have, would have said, it's too great, it's too hard. That's too much to ask, Lord. You're telling me at 14 years old to give up my life. That's too much to ask. And Mary says, wow, you're going to give me that opportunity to worship you? Let me do it right now. And, and she does. <laughs> and, and that brings us to our, 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 our final point. Yeah. Mary worshiped the Lord. She worshiped the Lord. Through this act of, of uh, obedience, but then so first, so look at the look at the um, the pattern here. First, she w obeyed God, then she praised God, and we're going to let's talk about that right now. Uh, Luke chapter one, verse forty six, uh, all the way through here. Uh, we're only going to go up to verse fifty here, but uh, it's typically called Mary's song, and it's Mary pouring out praise and worship. But it's important to understand. It was after she obeyed him. 
She obeyed him first. She gave the greatest offering of, of uh, praise and worship first and then let her mouth follow. Okay? And look what, it, look what is, uh, is said here. Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior, for he hath regarded the lowest state of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty hath done this great thing, hath done to me great things. And holy is his name, and his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. She just pours out of her heart this, this expression of praise and adoration for the blessings being given to her. And in doing so, she sets an example of how we can worship the Lord once we've obeyed, how we can worship the Lord also with our words. Okay, so how does she do that? Well, she praises God first and foremost. You ever, you ever wonder, how many of you have ever planned to pray? You know, you're going to go before the Lord in prayer, and you, it may not happen all, but you, you, nothing comes to mind. You ever been, you ever been in, a, in that spot? Sometimes that happens. You know, you, 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 if you've got times of prayer, like when I wake up in the morning, I, I get on my bed, I get on my knees, and I, I, I start my day with prayer. And there have been a couple of times where I got on, and I'm thinking, I'm almost not sure what to say. <laughs> I'm in the presence of God. I mean, what do you say to God? Mary kind of gives us some good, good opportunity, good, uh, uh, a good pattern here of praise. First of all, she praises God for her salvation. She praises God for her salvation. Mary said, uh, my soul doth magnify, doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my what? My, in God my Savior. God, my Savior. Like the rest of us, Mary was born in sin and in dire need of a Savior. And she simply praises God for this ultimate gift. So regardless of what life looks like right now, whether good, bad, or ugly, and probably we've got all, uh, everybody in here, there's people experiencing all three of those. There's some people in here probably, hey, things are going pretty good. Some people in here say, hey, things are kind of rough. And there may be some people in here saying, life is a nightmare right now. I don't know where you're at. But regardless of where you're at, if you've trusted in Jesus for uh, uh, salvation, you have a home in heaven. <laughs> and that's plenty of reason to praise the Lord. Uh, Luke chapter 10, verse 20, uh, Jesus says, Notwithstanding, in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. I mean, think about that for a second. God coming to this world in the form of a baby taking the ocean, putting it in a Dixie cup, taking the infinitude and the eternality of himself and putting it in a human baby vessel was for one reason and one reason only, to get you and me to heaven with him forever. I mean, when you think about that, when you, when you allow yourself to be overcome by the fact that we get to go to heaven, I don't have to experience hell. I don't have to experience suffering, heartache, and pain, and loss, and, 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 and my own struggles within my own flesh. I don't have to experience that. I don't have to be separated from God forever. Instead, Christ coming out of heaven and becoming that baby began the process of making it possible for you and I to go to heaven. I mean, doesn't that take your breath away? When you think about that, when you allow yourself to immerse your brain in the fact that I'm going to be in heaven, literally, forever. <laughs> I don't know about you, but regardless of what's going on in my life, if I go back to that place, I think, sometimes I think, Lord, it would be great if it happened right now. You know, uh, life is rough right now. Take, you know, it would be great if you came back for it now. But... I think about that, and I think, no matter what I'm going through, God's got a plan, and he made it possible for me to be with him forever. It just blows my mind. We have abundant reason to rejoice. Now, again, I don't want to trivialize heartache and pain and struggles and, 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 and illnesses and, and losses in, in the world. don't want to trivialize that at all, but I do want to kind of look at it in light of eternity for a moment. That's what we can do during this season. We can look at, that's why he came. 
That's why he came and became who he was and then suffered and died the way he did. That's why he came. If you have Jesus, you got everything. And you lack nothing. What else? How else did did Mary? She praised God for her salvation. She also praised God and realized that uh, God was doing wonders in and through her. So we see that in verses 48 and 49. It says, For he hath regarded the lowest state of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name. So, So... After all that is said and done, while many were going to ridicule her in that day, she knew that. She also knew for generations to come, once everything panned out, once people realized exactly what was going on, they were going to say, wow, Mary, you were blessed. Wow, Mary, you were were honored. And she recognized that she was actually being used by God in the process of saving humankind forever. You ever been part of something bigger than you? You ever put your hand to something or, or be involved in something that, that is so much bigger than you? Maybe because there's a bunch of people involved or maybe because it had a big impact uh, in the future or, or whatever the case may be. And you, and you step back and think, wow, I'm really glad I was a part of that. You ever been really glad to be a part of something? <laughs> think about Mary. In heaven right now, looking back and saying, wow, you really did it, Lord. And you allowed me to be a part of it. Amazing. And, and she, was, she was praising God for that. And every person that has come to become a child of God in this world, you, me, we have uh, the same opportunity to praise God for the great things that he's done in us. Think about the change you made in your life. I understand maybe not everybody in here knows the Lord as Savior, but but for a moment, think about that. If you know Christ as Lord and Savior, think about the changes he's made in your life. We all have a testimony. We all have that, 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 uh, that life story that says, yeah, I was, and now I am, and I will someday be, and it's all the story of God in your life, running through your life. It's It's incredible. It's incredible. Think of the benefits that are yours as a child of God. Think of the glory that awaits in our future. We've been blessed abundantly. We have much reason to praise the Lord. And verse 50, as she kind of closes it, we're going to close out with verse 50 here. Uh, Mary proclaims that she's not the only one who's going to receive this grace from God. It says, his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation, even until this day. And if, and if the Lord tarries and we got another thousand years, guess what? Generation to generation, people are going to be blessed by what took place during this time. In one great act, God changed the destinies of millions of people. One act. And here's, now, now think about that act. Did Mary do anything to make it happen? No. But she was available and a vessel to be used by God. And when God works in the life of one of his children, miracles happen. Wonders take place. We are indebted to Mary this morning. Not to the extent that we fall down and and worship her or or pray to her or, or, you know, hold her higher than anybody else. but, but, But we owe her a debt of gratitude for reminding us that we have a God who is worthy of love, Faith, obedience, praise, and worship. So, so what's the wonder of worship? It's the fact that God is not only worthy of our worship, but that we can offer him worship and praise and love every moment of every day, whenever. We can offer it to him at church. We can offer it to him at home. We can offer it to him on the way to work. We can offer the, this, this, this wonder of worship we can offer to him every moment of every day. You say, that's kind of overboard, isn't it? That's kind of that's overkill. That, isn't, that, isn't that, you know, how, how hard is that going to be? Well, 
How many of you own, I'm going to ask you a question as we close out here. How many of you own a cell phone? Raise your hand nice and high. You own a cell phone. Wow. Okay. Well, that fits with the statistics. Over 90%, 95% of adults own one in our country. Worldwide, there are more people that own cell phones than have access to a toilet bowl. Six million people have cell phones in our world today. Five million have access to a sanitation device. Okay. How many times do you think, do you think we're a little obsessed with our phones? Yeah. Be honest. I know the teenagers aren't going to respond to this one, but how many of you sometimes would almost wish that we never got them in the first place? Almost everyone. The teenagers are like, uh, I want two. Okay. I want the newest one this Christmas. I get it. I get it. Okay. And it doesn't make you less than anybody else. But studies do show that we are obsessed with our phones. Anybody want to take a guess at how many times per day we interact with our phones, whether it's a tap, a swipe, or a click, or whatever. Anybody want to take a guess at how many times the average person per day? 300. That's a lot. 300 is a lot. Okay? Let me give you the high end first. Let me give you the high end. Those that use theirs the most per day. This is a touch, swipe, or type. Okay, it's interacting with your, with your device. 5,427. The highest end user, so not you guys. Well, maybe a couple of teenagers. That's, I, I mean, think about that. And you say, Phew, I'm glad I'm not on the high end. Well, before you pat yourself on the back, the average person, 2,617 times a day, interacting with that plastic and electronic thing. The average person, 2,617. When you average those numbers out, the highest end users per year interact with their phone 2 million times. And the average person, 1 million in a year. You think, I don't even know if I can count to one million in a year. Well, you tap and interact with that thing. I do too. Okay? Now, statistically, the same number of people own Bibles. A couple of you got that look on your face. Oh, I know where he's going. <laughs> Pastor Chris is like, go for it. The same number of people own Bibles. As a matter of fact, in our country, the average American owns four Bibles. The average American owns four Bibles. That's a lot of Bibles. But apparently we're not reading them like we are interacting with our phones. The average person in our world, in our, in our, the average Christian in, in, in our country does pray at least once per day. Once per day. One... 2,617. You say, oh, you can't even put the two together. Yes, we can. Imagine if we interacted with God the same way we interact with our piece of plastic that is on our hip or in our purse or in our pocket. Imagine if we were, if, imagine if our wonder for worship was as great as our wonder for our phones. Just imagine that. Just imagine what this world would be like if we interacted with God even, even remotely near the way we interact with our phones. Now Mary didn't have a choice, did she? She had a baby. Those of you that had a baby, have had a baby, you know it's 24-7 until you kick them out of your house, right? 24-7, even when they get older, right? It doesn't really change a whole lot. There's that interaction, you, you got to do it. Mary had to do it. But Mary was interacting with God 24-7. Imagine if we took a page out of her book and said, you know what? There's a phone. And said, you know what? 
If that's God calling, we'll stop everything. Imagine, though, just imagine for, just for a second, if we interacted with God, I couldn't have planned that any better. <laughs> Whoever that was, thank you so much. That was great. Imagine if we interacted with God the same, or, or, or just going in that direction, with the same sense of urgency. We leave the house, and one of my kids, well, only one of my kids has a phone right now, but they, they all have an electronic device. We leave the house, and they forget their electronic. It happened yesterday. I was going down the road to my, uh, my, my sister-in-law's house. We forgot the electronic device. Oh, my goodness. Dad, Dad. I'm like, what? I thought a deer was jumping out, right? Because it's that time of year, too. Like, what? I, I forgot my phone. Yeah. We got to turn on and get it. <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. We kept going. But the urgency. And you teenagers and us adults, we know. We leave the house. Guess what? I've gone five miles down the road and realized, oh. Turn back and go. I won't do it for my kids. I'll do it for me because I'm obsessed with it too. <laughs> Imagine if we had the same sense of urgency that Mary had interacting with God. If we had the same wonder of worship. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads for a moment and close your eyes. We're going to we're going to close in prayer here, but but I, I want to. I just want to want to encourage each and every one of us. Let's come into this season. We're going to be looking at Christmas through the eyes of, of some of the people. Next week, we're going to look at the eyes, uh, look through the eyes of Joseph. Not a lot is said about Joseph, but a tremendous amount can be extrapolated from Joseph's life. And we're going to look at that. We're going to look at the wise men. We're going to, look, we're going to be looking at, at how people were in wonder of Christmas. And maybe, you know, maybe you came in here today, maybe, maybe you think, you know what, I, I, I never really thought about it that way. I never really thought about the fact that God came down to get me to heaven. My Bible says there is only one way to heaven. It's through Jesus Christ. We call upon the name of the Lord, we shall be saved. He is the only way. He said it himself. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. You're here today, and you have not taken that step. You have not responded to the call of God. Mary did. Mary responded. Mary like, Lord, here I am. Okay, I'll, whatever you want. Maybe God's spoken to you today. No, maybe it wasn't an audible voice or anything like that, but maybe through his word, through his spirit, through the, through the songs, through, through what took place here today, maybe God spoke to you and said, you know what? You and I never have really established a relationship yet. And, and he would say, I've always been ready to do that with you. Are you ready to do that with me? And if you are, and if God has moved in you today, and God has called you today, and you're ready to respond, you can, you can like the Bible says, call upon the name of the Lord. You can pray. You can say something as simple as this. Lord, yes, I'm, I, I, I've sinned. I've turned to, I, I haven't lived the perfect life. I don't think I ever could. Then you can say this, though. You say, Lord, but right now, as best as I know how, I want to turn from those sins. I, 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 I think the Bible calls it repent. I want to repent, Lord, and turn to you. And then you can say this. You can say, Lord, right now, this moment, I no longer trust in myself to get to heaven. I no longer trust in religion. I no longer trust in anything other than your son. I put my trust, my faith, my hope, in Jesus Christ, come into my life. Save my soul. Everyone's head bowed, everyone's eyes are closed. No one's looking around, just myself. The Bible says if you, you pray that from your heart, you responded to the call of God in your life and, and humbly came before him and received him as Lord and Savior, my Bible says you're a new creature. My Bible says your name is written in the book of life. My Bible says all of heaven at this moment is rejoicing at your new birth. Just as Mary, no doubt, rejoiced in the birth of her son. Just like you, no doubt, rejoiced in the birth 
of your children. God and heaven right now is rejoicing in your new birth. And if you have done that today, I would love to pray for you. I'm not going to ask you to do anything. I'm not going to ask you to come up here or anything like that. But I, but I would like to know who you are. So I'm the only one looking around. So if you just pray that with me or something similar to that just now, could you do me a favor? Could you put your hand up? You could put it right back. I just want to see you just for a second. Just see who you are so I could be praying for you. Father, we are in awe of you. The ocean in a Dixie cup. <laughs> Amazing. I thank you for those that, that have trusted in you, Lord. I've called upon your name. I thank you for people like Mary, who are faithful, obedient, and worshiped you moment by moment. Help us, Lord, to leave here today with that kind of mindset. Help us to embrace the wonder of worship. We love you so very much. We come to you in Jesus' name.